Okay, well, welcome to the Secret Teachings of Christ. And I'm pretty excited about doing this. I've been kind of sitting on this for a while. And today I'm going to be starting this get going. I just wanted to get the ball rolling today. And I'm going to be announcing an exciting thing at the end. We're going to be doing a bit of a four-week, four-class series and continuing to do this. I mean, getting a lot of requests to teach the scriptures and teach the sacred Gnostic writings and the deeper teachings of Christ. And I've been going more into these myself and using them in my own life to heal and shift and bring some profound changes. I think it's fair to say we're in a spiritual war like never before. And I think the attempt at assassination of Trump certainly showed that we're in a in the middle of an absolute, yeah, no doubt we're in a big war between light and dark at the moment. And definitely the time to start to go deeper and go into an inward journey. And one of the great things about Christ I want to start off by saying is that I believe we're in one of the most exciting, incredible times in history of this, I, in the early stages of a great awakening. And I heard a brilliant statement today, which was that the first time that Christ came, there was only the one. The second time that Christ comes will be the many. In other words, the second coming of Christ is realizing the Christ within all of us, the that the kingdom of heaven is in, is in, as Christ said, the kingdom of heaven is in you and that I abide in you and live inside of you. And it's people actually discovering the fullness of the God power and the Christ that basically dwells within each and every one of us when we do that. And the, the sacred scroll of Romans specifically talks about an inward quickening that happens where the Christ becomes alive within us and we get what's called born again. It's like, and we get, and we have many weird things about this, but born again just simply means, as Mark Twain put it, the first, he said, the two most important days of your life is the day that you were born, and the second one is the day when you know the reason you were born. And that, just let that sink in, when you know the reason that you were born, you know the reason that you're on this planet and why you're here. Yeah, William, don't you love it? That's... <laughs> The, sec the second coming of Christ is the fullness, is the many. The first Christ was the one. And Christ, in one of his secret teachings, gave this clue when he said, understand that the kingdom of heaven is like a seed that dies, but unless it dies, it cannot result in the many. And that's why he told his disciples, that's why I must die, that's why I must go. Because if I don't go, the Spirit won't arise in each of you, the Holy Spirit, and you will not come in to the Christ that's within you and discover the greatness of God that was within each and every single one of us. So the second coming of Christ is, as Roman puts it, the manifestation of the sons of God um, or daughters of God. In other words, the arising and awakening of it happening and in a time of great darkness. And the book of Daniel particularly talks about this and says that until we see the complete darkness and a glimmering and a dimming of the light, then we cannot see the full uprising of what's happening. And we're seeing a greater increase in the darkness across the planet because there's a preparation, there's a birthing in the in the um, planetary spheres for the rising and the manifestation of the sons and daughters of God. And I don't... And it's one of these things you just let it sink in and sink in. And Christine says goosebumps when you said that. Yeah, it's... Yeah, you got you get it, Christine. And when you get this and you really get, and today I'm going to be giving a bit of a sneak preview on all of this. In fact, I sent an email around through Global Wealth Clubs today. I'm not sure if um, any of you saw it, but I talked about the sobering days we are ahead, preparing for our Saturday event we're doing on the lawful sovereign rights. And I mentioned in Ephesians that Paul actually says, the same book that talks about the war we have ahead, he says that the saint, he says, the power of Christ, when you know that power, it is above all governments, it is above all realms, it is above all energy fields, it is above all auric, etheric bodies of everything, it is above all aliens, it's above all dark powers, it is above every single possible living thing on this, on, on any planet or anywhere in this galaxy or in this universe, is what he says in, in, in there. And I was fortunate enough to be trained in this as a young man, and I learned this and learned that the complete power we have over this dark and what we have over the whole, over 
everything that we see ahead of us. And one of the things for me today is just to let this kind of unfold because I'm brimming with uh, excitement and a fire in my heart. And it's just allowing it to slowly unfold and just come out in bits and pieces. One of the great things that John Wesley said, he said, get yourself filled with, the, with what's called the power of the spirit or the teachings or the deeper teachings of Christ or the deeper Christ within you and let the fire of God burn from your soul and men and women will come from miles around to see you burn. And that's basically what the teachings of Christ were meant to and why there's been such a profound attempt pretty much for thousands of years to keep the Christ and the higher teachings secret or away from the masses. What's interesting is even Christ was very careful who and what he shared to. And often today we think, oh no, Jesus Christ would never hold anything from people. But that's what you notice I mainly say Christ and not Jesus, because when the first coming was Jesus, Christ came as Jesus. The second time is the full Christ. And Christ was very clear, but he said, I will, do not cast your pearls before swine or give what is holy to the dogs, um, because otherwise they will trample you underfoot. In other words, don't share the pearls of wisdom with, with idiots or ignorant people who don't seek and who aren't willing to pay the price for the knowledge. And anyone who's learnt the deeper teachings of Christ, I know you've got, you know, Christine, you would know what I mean. You pay a price for it. You know, you pay the big price for it, whether it's an investment of time, investment of spiritual attack, investment of finances. There's so many ways we pay a price for this. So to, to learn the deeper teachings of Christ and let the fullness of the Christ manifest in you, this is a journey that once you get started on that, you will become more addictive than any coffee, anything you can ever do. When you start to realize that in actual fact, that the purpose of the teachings of Christ is to actually ascend you, to awaken your DNA, to ascend and awaken the full God consciousness in us and lead us into a much higher ascension, um, higher frequency, so that we move beyond the need to keep really basically even being here um, on this earth. In other words, where we start to fully awaken and embrace the God consciousness within us. So just maybe type in the chat while you're here, like what, what attracted you to come to this webinar? And just mention if you're inspired, you're excited, you're anticipating, just obviously something drew you here, just type in the chat. It's interesting, that's why I specifically decided not to market this one heavily. I just simply thought, whoever's meant to come, he will come. Because basically the higher Christ draws in the people who are hungry and seeking. Tony to learn, Beth curious. Christine was led, of course, absolutely. Gay, okay, learn more and be informed, yeah. Well, you will either, at the end of this training today, you'll either have a hunger to learn more or realise it's not for you, you know? Christine Evans meant to be here. I love that. Inspired, trying to make sense of the days ahead. Absolutely. The more you understand this, the more you will understand because it's knowing the reason that you're here and getting a reason. And that's, I've had, I'll share something with you before I go into this. I haven't really shared publicly until now, but I've had probably one of the darkest times of my life I've ever had since the day I was born um, last year and probably part of the year before. And I don't say that lightly. Um, I, the, the struggles and the suffering that I experienced, understanding what happened with COVID, why, what, what was going on, the death of my partner, um, feeling a loss of meaning and, and reason for being here, was a, a acute suffering that was so, so intense. I remember having to go to all kinds of um, yogic training and teachings and meditations and even one of the most profound mental health clinics I was led to to learn some of the, about stress management and end up being with, with, with a master in the mental health clinic who was teaching the deeper trainings of the Buddha of the Buddha and mindfulness and how to basically process and how to let go and how to let go and, and understand your human experience and your spiritual experience and work them together. So those who get led into this, you're going to learn a bit more about that. Just type a Y or me in the text chat if you actually really have difficulty living in the human experience when you're knowing the kind of higher principles. It's kind of like yeah, I'm here, I'm doing my stuff, but man alive, this human experience is just bullshit, what we see. Yeah, gay. Okay. Because I'm putting my hand up on that. I've had a huge struggle with that. And it's only been this year I've started to slowly unravel a deeper meaning. Fiona, yeah. Tony, many people go through that. 
And my biggest thing the last two years was owning that, really owning that struggle, that huge struggle and not fighting it anymore. And rather than trying to diminish it and say, I shouldn't feel like that, I said, well, I do feel like that. And it's it's started to make me see and understand a little bit more clearly. Um, and hopefully out of all of this, you'll get something today. And regardless of whether you continue on this journey about learning and it's, and I remember teaching Jesus the Badass a few years ago, which was a huge hit. Who was here at that one? Because I still get pestered to teach that again. And then we'll be giving a little bit of sneak preview on that today towards the end of his um, training. Who was at the Jesus the Badass? Christine, yeah. Okay. So we're going to get beginning now. Let me just give me 10 more seconds. I've got to grab something and we'll be straight on the way. Anita, to learn so much more of the truth. Well, one thing that the Christ said was, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free, Anita. And it does. The truth sets you free. And that's why COVID, I was able to make sense of it eventually, because the truth set me free. So to, to understand the teachings and the secret teachings of the Christ, we've got to start a little bit with looking at what I call the secret world history, but it's generally taught in the um, secret societies and taught in the Masonic Lodge, taught in the Rosicrucians and the Templars, and in many others. So it's important to understand this and start to get a bit of an input, not the history book that's in the diluted fiction novels that have been around since 1913, after the Rothschilds purchased the encyclopedias and pretty much changed everything. and that. So it starts by saying ignorance is what destroys our life. People are poor when they don't understand the laws of money and wealth. People are, are unhealthy and sick when they don't understand the laws of health. Um, when we don't understand the higher laws of God and of the Christ, then slowly our lives break down. And in the book of Deuteronomy, it specifically warned the, the Israelites, the higher seed of Christ was, was warned, but said, when you follow these laws and walk in and know the, the and, and walk in the laws of the Christ, not in religion, just to be clear, I'm not talking about religion. In fact, as you'll see, Jesus particularly was vicious towards religion. But he said, when you walk in these laws and obey these laws and live by the spirit, you will prosper, you'll be healthy, and you will be well. But he then goes to warn about what will come upon you and, and upon a society when it turns away. And in 2006, I was at a convention in Melbourne with, with Pastor Daddy Nalaya, who was a tremendous prophet, you know, a guy who literally in Sri Lanka was a miracle worker, raised people from the dead, had the secret police come to try and arrest him and kill him. And he just ordered him away in the name of Christ. And they ran for their lives um, in a time when people were being tortured, regularly saw miracles. I went to his meeting because I wanted to, uh, I was hungry and I'd been seeing him for years. And of course, the moment I walked in, I felt I was in a temple and I basically ended up going up the front for prayer. And as I was there, he just looked at me and said, who are you, brother? And the next minute he's asking me to speak to his people and share. And we end up chatting afterwards. But one thing he said from the pulpit, I've never forgotten it. It still brings goosebumps to this day. He said, I said, how did you get to Australia, Danny, from Sri Lanka? He just said in 2000, he said, I had a vision and a dream. And he said, and I woke up in the middle of the night and my room was full of light. And I thought my wife had turned a light on and I was annoyed. And then I saw Christ as clear as a bell. And Christ told me, I've called you to Australia, to a, to a country that's turned and lost its way. And he said, you need to go and warn this country and get people back to following the laws of basically the, the, the laws and the Christ. And he said, Australia has 20 years, Danny. And, he, and, he and I heard this from my, in at me. He said, if by 2020, Australians have not got themselves sorted out and got their priorities away from themselves and materialism and the way they've gone, he said, that country will be given over to a foreign power. It will lose its freedoms. And he said, it will be handed to a foreign force, a globalist power, and it will take a long time to get it back. So I don't know if, if that gives you goosebumps. Just put a wire, raise your hands. But I literally was in the meeting, heard him say that to me. And I'm sure you'll be encouraged to know that he had, he 1 million percent ignored all the lockdowns. He just said, of course, I will never let a satanic government tell me whether I have my church open or not. So there are people there. And basically, the it's playing out now. Absolutely, Christine, we're living it. It's one thing to prophesy. It's another thing to be living in it. 
And that's been my challenge and my struggle and suffering the last few years. Um, and thinking, you know, what, what what role is there left for me? I've spent 20 years, which I had, teaching and warning and going around Australia, sharing this stuff just like Danny. And, I've, and I said, what? where do we go from here? And the encouraging thing is, I can assure you that there is an awakening happening and there's something amazing that's coming out of all this. Um, so he's an interesting guy too. He took on the whole um, hate speech that was brought into Victoria in 2006 and single-handedly got the laws changed. So he's a good man to have on your side and good friend of mine. So things have happened before, though. That exciting thing, and as King Solomon the Great said, that there's nothing new under the sun. And everything that we're seeing has already taken place in the before. And we've been in, the, and, and one of the things that we can see is this whole war for economic control really comes down to this. And I want to emphasize what this says and what this doesn't say. And it's the beauty of being a former lawyer. It does not say that money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. In other words, without money, I think it's just as big a problem to not have money and do a spiritual path as it is to be consumed by money. E equal extremes are a problem. Poverty causes more hardship, more suffering, more greed than anything than just about having too much. So having too much in the sense of greed rather than using it for the greater good or not having enough can cause that. So the love of money. My experience is a love of money is what causes extremes, either poverty or things like that. And you'll see a lot of teachings on Christ about money. And one thing Christ never, ever taught poverty, despite what the church has tried to make you believe at times. He quite the opposite. He taught prosperity, but he also warned against the evils of becoming consumed of it and losing your your your, your basically purpose. And and we, we're living in a time when it's hard to know truth from lies because there's so much in, misinformation that's out there. And even the last few days of the assassination of, or attempted assassination of Trump, I've been watching with fascination how everyone's had all kinds of theories and Trump stage and all this. And I remember saying to someone, you know, I said, this is the problem. Our trust has been so completely gone. We start making up all kinds of stuff, whether it's there or not. You know, I said, whatever's true, time will play out. I said, personally, I think it was simple. I think someone tried to shoot him because he's making a real difference and he had a miraculous escape. I think it's that simple. And there was probably a democratic involvement and secret service plot at some level. But this is the problem. We all know there's so much misinformation out there. There's so much altered books. There's so many things that have happened. And this is why you've got to hunger and why you've got to seek and why Jesus said, one of the teachings of the Christ, he said, the kingdom of heaven is like a pearl, but a merchant went and sold everything that he owned, but he may get that one pearl. In other words, he said, Unless you're willing to give everything up and pay the price, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, he's not saying to be broke, but he says the path requires you to be unattached to what to, to everything on this earth, to realize we're on a pilgrimage on earth. That's all we are. We're spiritual beings in a pilgrimage on the earth. And we're here to do a way, um, to do a path. And one of the things that it says in the Psalms, it says, blessed is the, is the man or woman whose heart is set on pilgrimage and who walks in the highway of Zion. In other words, who is set on finding the truth. And I remember when I was 18 and I first had a experience of the Christ when I was hungry. I was a very hungry as a young man. I went to every meeting I could get to. But by the time I was 18, I was ready to walk away because I was like, I just don't feel what other people seem to get. And... I remember one night going along to a Pentecostal meeting thinking this is probably the last time I'll go unless something happens. And the, the the preacher got up and said, there's a young man who's here tonight. He said, this is my last time unless I have something happen. And I'm inviting you up the front because tonight you're going to get your heart's wish. And I went out the front and then next minute I was out and I was in a trance for a long time. I have no idea how long and came out. And I was a completely different man. It was like I switched, be shy, insecure, very low self-worth, incredible inferiority complex young guy, which I was, which some of you might find hard to believe now, but I had immense self-esteem issues. I was shy. I was a very broken young guy. I'd been bullied as a kid. I didn't like my family. I didn't like living at home. 
I felt empty most of the time. I felt like I couldn't connect with anything or anyone. I felt this constant emptiness and deadness in my soul. I don't know if any of you can relate to that, but it just stayed there and stayed there. And when I had that happen, I, it was different. I remember coming out of it and I, I didn't feel that anymore. I felt this connection with God and I felt this awakening, which I since discovered from learning the secret teachings of the Christ, that what happened was my eighth chakra was awakened with fire. There was a kepharic fire or flame that was set on fire and completely just accelerated the opening of my eighth chakra, which then raced right through the rest of my chakras and opened me right up. And the teachings of Christ are so profound. The Bible, as it says in Hebrews, is merely a starting point. It's a starting point. And there's so many other sacred scrolls. I mean, Jesus taught for 11 years after he died. He, he came on earth and taught his disciples in a mystery school, in an astral mystery school, which many don't know about in the Epistle of Sophia. Tony says, I have the same lack of connection. Yeah, many do. Who here often at times feels that emptiness? Just raise your hand or type a Y. Like you feel that at times. You know, just this like, oh, just like craving that connection. Yeah. Well, this is what you'll find. But no human, I mean, I, I, I've learned to enjoy the human experience at the time of my life. But you'll get the deepest connection basically through basically through this, so to speak, and having that. And I remember I was a different man. William used to have, I know, yeah, your life totally changed, William, after you had that. So, yeah, it totally, this is what the secret teachings of Christ can do. It can awaken you and awaken your chakras, awaken your third eye and reconnect you back to, to the source. So, and, it, and pretty much when you read many of the sacred scrolls and teachings of Christ, there's been this constant war right throughout history to keep the sacred scrolls. We had a whole mystery school, the Alexandria Mystery School, set on fire and burnt by the Romans to stop people doing that. The Catholic Church have got 12 miles of hidden scrolls and mystery books to stop the people being empowered. So keeping the masses enslaved has been part of it for centuries. And in a way, it's been allowed because the Christ wants people to hunger and doesn't want to give the teachings, the deep teachings lightly, except for those who are willing to pay the price. So basically the secret world history, which is written by Jonathan Black, which is a really useful book to read. And he's researched all of the different um, teachings of the Christ, of the secret societies, of everything else, and summarized the, the common findings right up until the present day and even the coming of the Antichrist, as he calls it, the days when a whole Antichrist um, will, will arise and take control and create a globalist order and what and how that goes to the awakening. So it's very interesting because in the book of Genesis 1, it talks about let there be light. And not many people think about that. But before that, Jonathan Black explains something which you can see a clue from the Bible, the age of Saturn or Satan, where everything was dark, everything was black, everything was dense. If anyone's ever seen the movie Doctor Strange, um, in that movie, they, there was the, the Dark Lord where, where time just stopped and everything was dense. So the age of Saturn or Satan is where everything was kind of like in this void, where there was just nothing. And... People who've actually visited the lower actual realms, which are talked about in the Buddhist teachings, in the um, some of the Christian teachings like purgatory, um, or Jesus talks about the outer darkness, about Gehenna, there's all different astral realms. Um, one of them is they've seen this darkness, this place where everything is slow, it's dense, it's heavy. In a, in a vision, in a time when I was taken in the realms for, for many days and months, it happened to me some years ago when I was on a Hunger, hunger journey and I was taken into this lower astral realm and I saw it and it was dense very very dense and heavy and it was horrible I'm like I do not want to stay in this place <laughs> now I didn't like it at all and I got out of it as fast as I could um and then what happened and this is taught in the Masonic Lodge you know so before so basically it fell into a darkness because there was a great fall that happened, a galactic fall, the fall of Satan, as they call it, which resulted in everything and resulted in the universe going into a dark period and things like that. And yeah, William's seen the lower realms too. Yeah, Grace has seen it too. Um, I know she 
told me about it. She saw it before any of us. But then what happened was the Elohim or the creator God said, let there be light. And that was the beginning of, of a new earth. And that is why when you actually understand the Bible, I always, I understand it in the sense that a lot of people say, yeah, but the Bible doesn't say this, this and this. Imagine trying to write a history book right now in this minute. There's no way you could do it. You would literally have to write a 10, 100 million, thousand million, billion page book to get the history of the world. So the Bible really is only meant to be a particular history period to do what's called the Christ seed. If you actually understand it, his story, the Christ story. This is what I was taught in the underground movement by many great reformers. And every one of them, by the way, had a King James Bible and talked to me about this. But they said, you understand, it's the, his story. It's the, it's the story of the Christ. It's the beginning of the new earth when the earth was recreated and given a whole regeneration, so to speak. So we're living in a regenerated earth. That's the way to think about it, where we're in a, um, which the Hindus talk about it as the day. And the period before was what was called the night. So, or the age of Saturn, which is called the night. And this was a day of which there's seven eons or seven days. So the other thing to understand with the Bible, as Master Sri Yuketswa in the Kriya Yoga said, he said, you have to understand the Bible as an esoteric um, book. that was written for mystery school teachings for people who are familiar of the day of the symbology of the Gnostic mystery teaching. So if you try to read the Bible as a linear book, it'd be like you and I, it's like someone trying to watch this presentation 2,000 years from now and make sense of it. We'd probably be sitting there pissing ourselves laughing from the higher realms, trying to understand how people could have got it so wrong. So a lot of the Bible is written in symbolic, right from the story of the serpent and the snake and Adam and Eve and everything. And when you understand that, you start to see the deeper teachings of Christ. So it's important to understand that. And originally, mankind or man and womankind was an agrarian like a very farming age everyone was in sovereign communities we didn't have kings and governments imposing taxes and people doing new world order shits and any of that stuff people just lived simple lives on the earth um lived till generally up to a thousand years old because it was a much better climate it was a better um dna people had higher dna templates and things like that and I won't go into into too much into this because it just we could be here for ten hours, but that kind of got corrupted, and there would end up being a flood. And as Jonathan Gray, or sorry, what Jonathan Black explains, would be entered into the age of the gods or heroes. Now I used to love Greek mythology as a kid, or the Titans, where what started happening was higher angelic beings started coming down to earth and breaking their angelic laws to get involved in the human experience and start partaking in it when that was not basically what had been agreed to do in the higher order. And this is talking about in the Bible, in the book of Enoch and in various other books. And suddenly people started seeing like, you know, like Poseidon we hear about. And then suddenly we see like um, basically um, people with fish coming up like fish tails and all that and great gods. And some, some were, you know, were good ones, but, there were ones who just came in and they started to teach the um, human race stuff that they weren't meant to be taught or just weren't ready to be taught. And on top of that, they started creating these what's called hybrid anarchy beings or hybrid kind of um, DNA beings, which ended up basically in a bit of a mess and ended up pretty much in a bit of a flood and all kinds of problems. And then all these secret societies and then war came out of it because one of the the gods who came taught them war, taught them how to fight, taught them how to get like weapons, um, taught them how to do magic and necromancy and spells, you know, but to manipulate like black magic, all kinds of stuff. And basically, after things settled for a while, then we have what was called the Tower of Babel, which is a whole foundation of Babylon or the Babylonian system today. And Babel means just that confusion. And Babylon means that like the land of confusion. And we're living in a in a time called the Babylon, literally modeled exactly after the Babylonian ancient civilization. And so right throughout history, there was this conflict between the Christ seed and what's called the, Bab the seed of Satan or the Babylonian seed. And you can see that it's right through the Bible. In fact, right at the start, when Adam and Eve had the situation when the two of them kind of got a bit naughty, 
and Eve got trapped into her dark feminine and she ended up doing what, what happened. And then Adam ended up getting, you know, the same old story, um, getting misled. Um, the next, the, basically one thing it was said was that, a, was, that, was that the Christ will come and crush the seed of his serpent and the great fall that's taken place where suddenly man, mankind and womankind were immortal, which we were at one stage and then living to a thousand years. And then gradually we disintegrated as a race and disintegrated and disintegrated and started living less and less time and the planet got worse and worse and worse. But the one promise that was given in every secret society right through that period, they knew there was the coming of the sun god or the coming of the son of righteousness, the, the Christ. The And Jonathan Black talks about this. They all knew and talked about the coming of the Christ, the whole, um, which would bring in a whole new age for humanity and a whole new opportunity to start to raise consciousness again and no longer be part of the planet and no longer be part of what's happening um, and, and and have a choice to raise our consciousness and move beyond things. And there's all kinds of um, teachings and learnings on frequency fences and others, which I won't go into. I mean, who's heard, by the way, of the frequency fence and the limits of consciousness that were placed upon the planet? Just type a Y if you're familiar with that. That list you go through the Christ or the stuff the limitations in being able to, yep. So some of you have, yep. So basically, um, then there was a time of Egypt, which we hear about Moses, the, the great delivery or the Exodus. Um, then, of course, we had the Babylonian Empire, as well as the time of the Hebrew kings that were kind of in conflict. And what was interesting was this is why I said the whole Bible is meant to tell the story of the Hebrews or the Israelites and show the journey of the Christ seed and those who chose to stay separate from the world and see it as a pilgrimage, um, basically to help, you know, serve the planet, serve the consciousness, and ultimately through that service, be able to ascend, be able to basically master the human experience. So that basically you had the Hebrew kings and queens that were living at the time, and you can, and a lot of that's talked about in the Bible, and in, and and also in some of the other secret teachings, and in the other scrolls as well. In the meantime, you had the Babylonian Empire, the Persian Empire, Alexander the Great. There was a great Alexandrian mystery school that was built that taught everything from time travel to consciousness to energy to DNA activation. Extraordinary place which got burnt down. But keeping in mind that all throughout history, sacred scrolls, even when it was burnt down, there were always priests and others who were fleeing and hiding the secret scrolls to keep them from the dark. Because these are, they knew the importance of these sacred scrolls and these sacred teachings. The Romans especially, they really wanted a new world religion because they knew that with religion, if you give people the power and if people start to get empowered through their spiritual teachings, you can't control them, can you? So... You can't control a population who knows its power. This is what like narcissists are like in relationships. You know, they, they want to control you. Otherwise, they're afraid of losing you. And they don't want you to be empowered. Has anyone here ever been in a narcissistic kind of environment like that? Were you with a power partner who did everything to keep you suppressed and disempowered? I'm just curious. Just type up. Yeah, so generally a lot of people have that, you know. They end up experiencing that yeah so as you start so the biggest thing is as you start to discover and awaken to the power of the christ within you um keeping in mind the establishment and the system does everything to keep it and as you'll see shortly there was a whole period of history where the whole aim was to keep the masses after the christ from awakening because really since the christ came two thousand years ago the kingdom of heaven was birthed within the soul of this planet and there's been a constant, absolutely frenetic attempt by the dark to keep the people from getting that and being able to rise up into the Christ, into the fullness of the second coming of Christ. Because this starts to happen, the planet will awaken and we'll be entering a golden age, which has been prophesied in many, many of the great teachings. And the Hindu teachings talk about a great golden age that will come. The secret history of the world also talks about this great golden age that would come. Um... But what happened was they always talked about this son of righteousness, which talks in the book of Malachi. But unto you that fear my name, shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go forth and grow up as cars of the stall. 
And when you read the the, the translation of that, because in the King at uh, the King James, fear my name means the name is like your consciousness. In other words, who respects and honors and reveres the law of the Christ, reveres the higher laws. Shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing? In other words, healing in his wings. Talked about in Psalm 91 in the teachings of the Christ, where the wings of, of Christ surround you. I've experienced that when I had a car crash so severe in 2011, I went straight into a lamppost on the freeway. My car went like an accordion. I should have been absolutely instantly killed. And I literally felt wings and like something around me. And my whole mind went quiet and calm. Time slowed down. I, I got out of the car without a single scratch, without anything wrong with me. I think Trump and I would probably have a similar conversation after what he went through a few days ago. But literally, I was absolutely in shock. It sobered me up and certainly got me away from the madness of my life I started to move into. Um, but basically, the sun of uh, healing. So as you start to connect with the Christ, you will start to have that um, healing and that consciousness and that emptiness starts to slowly diminish. And... I realized I fell back into that emptiness the last two years as I lost a lot of hope. And as I've started to reconnect and find that meaning in my life again, I've noticed the difference, that constant sense of that deeper fulfillment that started to come. And really, when I feel grief more now, I'm starting to realize it's like what Paul says in the, te in the teachings of the Christ. He said, when we're in a human experience and we start to become aware of our spiritual nature, often the grief can go deeper because we yearn to be back in our spiritual home. We yearn to be back where we where we belong. And Paul says he constantly was yearning to be back home in his in his basically where he came from. Um, and is it interesting, but so profound was the impact of the Christ, as well as the Bible being the best selling book in history, that even our even our year 2024 is what? 2024 after Christ, AD. Um, so we've got BC and AC. So the whole world is still done on that. That's how important the coming of the Christ actually was. And what I find fascinating is that many missed the, missed the coming of the Christ because everyone was waiting for some accolade and some amazing thing to appear in the sky. Instead, just all happened very quietly, came up, taught the message, just the one, died and, 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 and was gone. And it was simply meant to put the seed in there to in the ground and did everything he possibly could to avoid ego and avoid glory and it's been one of the biggest things i've noticed the last two and a half years and one of the reasons i suffered so deeply was i realized in hindsight how much i'd served with conviction during covid to awaken people but there was a little bit of ego in there too i'd realized in the sense i'd had a bit of a preconceived idea that as we did this people would awaken and certain things would happen and the exact opposite seemed to happen and one of the one of the things I've discovered, which I've come back to, is the surrender to the will of God and understanding what Christ said when he says, you know, to the Father, not my will, but yours. And that's been my prayer of the last two weeks. I said, God, I surrender. Christ, I surrender to your path. Lead me, guide me, and help me to do my work and help me to make a difference because this planet has gone completely God, God damned, absolutely crazy. It's in a seriously bad space and something's got to be done about it. And I, it's out of my hands. I don't have, I don't have any ability to do anything about this thing. Really. I just need your guidance. And all I got in the end, I thought what I can do is I can teach, I can share these teachings and awaken and let the Christ start to awaken more in people to start to rediscover that in you and learn these secret teachings of Christ. And start to discover meaning in your life because that's what's going to bring change that's what's going to that's what's going to get things turned around on this earth that's what's going to give a deeper meaning in our life and a deeper sense of conviction and one of the things you will find as you start to learn and experience these deeper teachings you will start to discover and some of you may even have a profound awakening that's why christ said you know you must be born again and he wasn't saying you must join a church and do a weird prayer he just said you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven without a radical turning inside out where you have that awakening. You have your DNA just woken up. You have that inner spiritual infilling, which awakens your DNA, awakens your higher self, awakens your spirit, where suddenly you're like, yeah, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. Um, just type of me in the chat if you have actually know you had an experience. There was a time when something happened in your spirit or your heart. We had this hunger, and one, and it almost happened very quickly.
Yeah, so yeah, few. Yeah, and, and when you get that, you start to get a hunger. And God, my one of the reasons I've held back teaching this stuff is that once I start, I think I could spend 24-7 teaching this stuff. It is such it's I'm so hungry when I teach this stuff. Um, but before Christ and after Christ. So that's what we're living in. Um, and after Christ, it's important to also understand that up until 320 AD, there was this constant kind of fight between the, the new way, the Christed people, and the Roman religion were horrified because suddenly you had these people who were living their own truth, living a sovereign way of being. And the Romans were like, no, 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 no. We're okay. Because the Romans were overall pretty decent. They let people, you know, have their own religions provided, but they bowed down to Caesar and honored Caesar. So you can run your religion, you can do all your weird rituals as long as you bow to Caesar and acknowledge that Caesar or government is Lord. The early Christians said, no, 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 no. We honor the Roman laws, but we will not bow to Caesar um, and basically say Caesar is greater than Christ because that goes against the Bible and goes or goes against, not, there wasn't a Bible back then, it goes against our knowing of the Christ. And their reward was they were fed to lions and tortured and all kinds of things. Um, of the 12 apostles, 11 were martyred for their faith. They were killed of Jesus' 12 main disciples. Um, instead of Peter, the man that actually denied Christ um, at the cross, he actually was was crucified upside down and because he, he actually said, I don't want to be crucified right side up because I'm not worthy to die the same way that Christ did. And so all the apostles, you know, Thomas, you know, who went, um, the one who it was in the Bible talks about him as a doubter. He ended up being flayed with knives in India when he went and actually taught the, the message of Christ. And he bought much and he bought much of the teachings into India. Um, Joseph of Arimathea and one of the disciples brought it to Britain. That's why Britain carried the common law, because the common law came from the time of Christ. The teachings of Christ was carried through Britain. And many believe that the 12, but many of the original tribes of Israel end up in Britain. And that is why Britain has always had this very, very strong well, Christian or kind of God heritage, which is carried right through, which is a whole different teaching. But where the hunger, the teachings of Christ have been there pretty much for a long time, hidden in the background. And so before Constantine, you had this war um, and basically between the church um, or between the Romans, it was like, you've got to do this. And basically, these people say, no, we refuse to do it. I mean, these guys are real badass. You know, like Trump standing there after he got shot, like, you know, fight. You know, you had people who, I mean, some of the greatest heroes came from these times, people who were just, you know, tortured, basically. They were killed for their faith. Um, one of the most remarkable stories, or is the one that's probably fascinated me the most, is John. Because the Apostle John was considered the closest of Jesus' um, 12 disciples, and no one ever found his body. It's my personal belief that John literally never died. He actually learned to turn his body into light, and there's a lot of evidence in Scripture and in the Gnostic teachings to this effect. But it was well known that when they were killing pretty much um, anyone who was following the Christ teachings and refusing to, to submit to the Roman law strictly, they were being bought out and killed in public. Nero, when he went on his purge, took the Apostle John, took him right out into the, um, and, he, and he basically wanted to kill John in front of everyone to make a real example to show them that, you know, Caesar had greater power over Jesus' greatest disciple. And he actually put John in oil and set him on fire. Now, it's interesting because in the scriptures, John talked about in the secret teachings of the Gnostics that you can literally drink deadly poison and it won't hurt you. You can be in the fire and you will not be burned. And... The whole time John was smiling, and after pulling him out, he was completely unharmed. And that and Nero was so freaked out because the people started screaming he was a god, he was taken and put on the island of Crete, and that's where he wrote the book of Revelation. In terms of understanding the teachings of Christ, one of my particular favorite um, accounts of John, which I actually took this and applied this myself during the COVID time, and some of you who are part of that project saw the difference that we made. John... John went into a city that was probably one of the most corrupted, evil cities where even Paul the Apostle was terrified to go there and create a storm in the city of Ephesus, which the story was had some of the strongest um, dark spirits pretty much of the day. And John went out and straight out challenged all the elders of the city and the churches and said, 
um, and, and encourage him. He said, I want you to get all of your best black magicians, sorcerers, um, and I want you to all curse me and try and kill me. And he said, once you've done that, I'm then going to do it to you and kill all of you off. And they freaked out and wouldn't do it. And so John walked out into the city and C.P. Wagner talks about it in one of his um, books teaching on this. He went out and he, and he spoke to the, um, and he spoke to the spirit and spoke to the biggest statue in the city. And he ordered the spirit, um, the spirit to leave the city and leave it now. And the whole statue collapsed in front of the whole um, people. And of course there was just a major awakening that happened through the city. And Basically, because John knew something, he knew that the spiritual authority is what governs the earth, that when you see human ones, they do this. All these human guys, I mean, many of you by now have read the internet and heard about some of them, about the reptilians and how Justin Bieber and some of them were the human skulls and in Hollywood. It's because these spiritual beings, they run it. These guys channel these, these spiritual beings. And what John knew was what it says in the book of Ephesians, was that when you have the Christ teachings within you, you have absolute authority over these things. I, I realized that one of the things I'd lost a bit of my balls in the last couple of years, and I started to go back and do that today. I started to take authority in recent weeks again over things. And I go for a drive. I take authority over spirits. Um, everything is written in the, in the spirit realm. For example, you have a spirit that controls the whole legal system. And you can see that spirit operating right now when you look at, say, America, um, there, there's, there's also spirits that actually bring in false laws and laws designed to, to enslave, steal and tax and ruin people. And it's all written in there. Um, the walls of the scroll of the Dead Sea Scroll, the teachings of Christ's fair. So the whole spirit realm is clearly taught. And what's amazing is that years ago when I was with Grace, um, who some of you know, my ex-wife, but also my co-pastor and, you know, teacher when we do stuff together, um, we met guys who'd come out of this, you know, dealing directly with the dark movement. And these guys were telling us, like, how do you know half this stuff? Because they have a, the dark army have a full time people designed to actually keep the church and keep the people from understanding the deeper teachings of Christ and understanding their authority and understanding their power. Because once you understand your authority, understand your power, the city and, and would wake up in no time because Christ made it very clear. He said, if you actually know who you are, he said, you can literally um, be in the heavenly places. You're equal with me. You're in my power and you have full authority over the whole earth. That's what he said. The very thing which was, was God said to Adam was you have dominion over the earth. And Christ said to anyone who walks in the teachings of Christ, you have authority over the spirit realm. Um, and... I know I've seen that. I've seen spirits cast out of people and people instantly healed. I've seen extraordinary um, miracles happen with this kind of stuff. Once you deal with the spirits and you actually remove them. I had a situation where two weeks ago, I'll share this. I, I'd done everything to stop my suffering and all that kind of stuff and deal with it. And I'd done all the right things. And I still was doing it. I felt to go and see a guy, a guy who I knew understood this. And as soon as I went and saw him, he said to me, what's been going on with you? Because he said, there's a dark attachment. And, he, and I realized that there was a spirit that had taken over and was affecting my consciousness so badly and, and constantly attacking me. As soon as I removed that spirit, I was in shock. My whole mind went clear, clear as a bell. I could see everything that was going on again and how I, I, I stepped away from things. And I was in absolute genuine shock for days about that. And these things are very, very subtle. And... I'm sharing a lot of this because I feel that people are ready for this now. And one of the things when you understand the secret teachings of the Christ, Christ did a lot of discussion about the dark. People say he didn't get caught up in it, but he was very clear about the about the dark. He said, for example, he talked about um, to his disciples, but he just said to them, don't worry about it. He said, I saw Satan fall from heaven by lightning. Just cast the bugger out. If you see one, just tell him to get out. And this is one of the things which I've learned to do. And so this is a big thing that was going on was back before 320. Um, there was this constant war going on, but it's, I want to emphasize that the biggest issue that these guys were facing was the fact that the government of their day was saying, look, we're fine with you running your religion, but you must do all your spiritual work, but you must ultimately acknowledge that the government takes authority over you. So that was the basic idea.
So you must acknowledge that the government has authority. And so it's really interesting. And one of the things that Constantine did was he actually, it's interesting, there's a whole shift I felt been happened. So excuse me, that's why I went a bit, oh. But with Constantine, he tried to bring unity and get everyone on the same page. And so they ended up saying to the um, people, look, we're going to leave you guys alone. Um, if you guys want to go ahead and do your Christ stuff, that's fine. Um, let's just find something that doesn't quite, you know, rattle everyone's feathers. And the Catholic Church came out of that. Now, keep in mind, the Catholic Church was already kind of happening. It was a, it was the original satanic Babylonian kind of pagan priest thing. And many of you know about the legal system and how that happened, um, where you have priests and things like that. And so what basically happened was they kind of did things like change the symbology. So you had Easter, Ishtar, all that kind of stuff, and Christ, Mary, and they started bringing in these names for some of the pagan symbology. That's why, for example, the Catholic Church is literally running in a pagan um, symbology thing, just happening to chuck Christ and Mary in. Um, the modern day wedding is actually a pagan ceremony where they're just chucking these kind of Catholic rituals. We cannot comprehend how much the Catholic time still to this day controls our system. We cannot comprehend it. It's like, it's why the Bible is still a heavy part of our legal system. Uh, because the Catholic system has been around for a very, very, very long time. And it's important to understand this. And often we think it's all changed. Now it hasn't. Christmas, Christ's Mass. We still celebrate the Christ's Mass in the Western world. Um, so we really are in that. And it's important to understand as well that the Catholic Church slowly rose to power. And like I said, it's, God, it's hard to kind of, everything in me wants to kind of deviate off. But to cut a long story short, there's a whole lot in the secret teachings of Christ and in the history book stuff that's been very much suppressed, for example, about how Muhammad joined forces with the Catholic Church. And that was how they came to power, even though they supposedly don't like each other. Um, how basically the Pope was trying to get the Khazarians in order, who ultimately became what's called the Rothschilds and other Jews, but um, the Eastern European ones that control the world to this day. Um, and basically what we ended up with was the Dark Ages, where, as we remember them now. Now, what was it that was so imperative about the Dark Ages? The Dark Ages was pretty much about the church just doing everything to stop the Reformation, stop people awakening up to the Christ within them. So what they did was they, plunked, was they actually granted that they had the Pope, which literally vicarious Philae died, which is on his um, throne, means in place of the Son of Man. In other words, I am the mediator of God. You come to me and you're all going to be good. And the kings of the earth started to believe it. Um, if you upset the Pope, the Pope would um, and pronounce you a heretic, you'd be excommunicated. So imagine the ultimate social credit system where basically you were excluded from buying, selling, traveling around, just about anything, if you had basically been excommunicated by the church. So the last thing these people wanted was to have that happen. And there's a few ways that the Catholic Church kept the, the teachings of Christ um, suppressed. Number one, you could not own a Bible unless you were a priest. And number two, all Bibles by law had to be in Latin and only priests could learn Latin. So that made it nice and easy to keep the people disempowered and make sure that they could say whatever they want. They would even have people paying license fees to the church for permission to sin and fuck their next door neighbor's wife or things like that. And kings and queens dare not go against them. Um, if you ever want to read an interesting book, the Fox's Book of the Martyr, um, which, was, which talks about um, Joan of Arc, um, Jan Huss and many others who stood against the church, one of my favourites was probably as well as Joan of Arc. My two favourites was Joan of Arc, and the other one was Savonarola. Probably none of you have heard of Savonarola, but Savonarola was an Italian prophet in the 1300s. He did all the right things. He went to Mass because he didn't want to upset the church, but he started having visions and dreams and seeing Christ. And, of course, in those days, you admitted that. You would be branded a, a witch or wizard, and you would be burnt at the stake, tortured and shit like that, and called a Satanist, hence why many women were burnt as herbalists and anything else. Savonarola um, then started to do miracles and people basically started seeing extraordinary healings. And then before he knew it, he would stand there and he would teach in the public square. People would flock to him. 
The Catholic Church put up with him because he went to Mass faithfully and he kept telling all of the people to go to Mass. Um, so they, they kind of had an informal understanding with him where they left him alone, even though they didn't like it, where he was doing miracles and doing great works. This man, in fact, the when Rome was going to be invaded by the King of France, um, or, or it was France or Spain or someone, they were terrified because the army had been coming in invading all the cities and basically what happened was um, was France or Spain, they came in and Savonola actually walked out into the desert and he waited. And when the king came, he was so astonished, he just saw this young boy who was, who was 18 years of age waiting for him. And he goes, what are you doing here? He just said, I've come in the name of God to ask you to lead my people in peace. He goes, why would I do that? And he just said, because I'm a prophet of God. And he said, and it will not go well for you. But he said, I'm just asking you from my heart not to do that. And he apparently spoke with such authority. The king said, okay. And he turned around and left. So he moved in an authority and power, which, because he knew, he, he knew all the stuff that in the secret teachings of Christ, he knew this stuff. He managed to get the books and he'd read them. However, his reward, he was burnt at the stake because eventually he stopped going to mass. And once he stopped going to mass, that was the beginning of the end. And he was burnt at the stake. And so it's 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 difficult to understand, but you'll understand what's happening if you understand this stuff. And that's why I said I'm giving a sneak preview, but there's a lot to teach in this stuff because you will actually, everything that's happening today will make perfect sense once you understand this time of history and the whole mission of the dark to bring it back. That's basically what this is about. I I was led to an extraordinary secret site where I, where I saw the stuff, whistleblowers and everything, where basically since the 1500s, there's been an attempt by the Jesuits and others to bring back the Dark Ages, and they're doing it in a different way than what they did before. So the secret to the Dark Ages was the church controlled things, they had access to the sacred scrolls, they did it with the governments and kings, they would excommunicate people in a major social credit system. Um, is this sounding familiar to anyone at the moment? <laughs> anyone kind of going, oh yeah. So... Basically, the secret to control people is to have a social credit system where your livelihood depends upon it. And this was basically what the Dark Ages was. And the one, one glorious exception was England, because England had William the Conqueror come in, and the common law, mainly due to him, to Merlin, the great prophet Merlin, and, and various others, the message of Christ had continued, and the common law and the, the law of Moses had continued to be taught in England. Um, but of course, there was always this push to take control of England. The Magna Carta was then came in, where the barons and the lords, not the peasants, were given their freedoms. Then you had the great renaissance with King Edward, um, a great, great Christian king who basically bought, drove out the, um, the bankers, the Jewish Khazarians, um, kicked them out, um, executed the naughty ones, um, cancelled all the loans, did a great big jubilee, and within 10 years, Churches sprung up everywhere. People were going to church to worship. They were doing painting and people working 23 um, um, weeks of the year, 29 weeks off. And uh, society entered the golden age and the renaissance as we hear now. Again, you never heard all that, did you? Because that's all being removed from the history books. Because the last thing you want to realize is the power of these great renaissances. So one of the most significant events in the last 2000 years was the, was the revolution where basically the, the church's authority was challenged by some great leaders like Martin Luther, by Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King, uh, and various others, and John Calvin, one of my favourites, where they pretty much came out and said, no, 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 no. You don't need the church. What you need is you need to realise that the just shall live by faith, by the Christ that lives within them. We all have access to Christ direct. We don't have to go through the fucking boat. Now... Basically, for about 50 years, that was causing deaths and killings, but eventually the movement got so great because the Bible started to get out in English. Calvin basically said, fuck you to the governments and everyone else, and he translated the Bible into perfect English and just spread it all over England. They tried to kill him. He fled to Geneva, and he created the Geneva Bible. What's very interesting about the Geneva Bible is the fact that the Geneva Bible says very, very clearly that um, the, the true follower of Christ will honour the government of the day, but will not 
basically under any circumstances go go and honor any law that goes against the higher law of God. And in other words, we'll say, if your laws do not align with God's law, we will stand against it. We'd rather not, but we will. So we had various other things happen, which I won't really go too much into today, like which went through the, the, the Star Chamber, which was an, another period to try and take away freedoms but eventually resulted in the Bill of Rights, the, the trial by jury um, entrenched into law, the Bible on the table. All these events I'm showing here were all designed to bring back freedom for the people and to let the people have their Bibles on the table and a big fuck you to religion that was trying to control them because ultimately religions, what they basically became um, was, was pretty much, they started off, with the right motives, where, where what a great preacher once said, all reformations start in a cave but end in a cathedral. So they became organized, and once they became organized and prosperous, they wanted to keep their status, and they were tended to fit in with the state. And we saw that in COVID. The church just pretty much bowed to the state and bend over. And that was the sole reason why they got away with it. Um, Florida, where the church didn't do that, um, they didn't get away with it, and Florida, as by and large, kept its freedom. So understanding the teachings of Christ is what's going to bring changes in society. So this is all stuff I won't go too much into today. But ultimately, it's fair to say that the aim of the Jesuits, and if you actually read um, Dr. Daniel's book, after the Reformation, the Jesuits was formed with the purpose of bringing back the Catholic ages and the greatness of the church, but to do it in the background. And that's been the whole mission to do it in. And there's the dark occultic secret societies that have been doing everything to work together to control the system and to bring in a new dark ages or social credit systems, globalist order, where we're in another dark ages. And I think they've done a really damn good job, which I'm sure you would agree. So it's ultimately what's going to, for you to understand the teachings of Christ, you have to be activated and you must realize that first and foremost, that we're sovereign. This is why I think so many people resonate with Trump, you know, because Trump knows his enemy, knows the deep state, knows this governmental system that's aiming to bring in a dark age and try to say this is not what we want for America and not what we want for the world. So who's enjoying this, by the way? I'm just curious who's getting a bit out of this today so far. Yeah, Fiona, feeling relieved at the same time. Yeah, Yes, it all makes sense, doesn't it? When the, the truth sets you free, Fiona. Once you start to understand the truth, you go, oh, yeah, no big deal. Um, I will just actually show you one of the teachings of Christ, which Paul says. So this is what Paul says in Ephesians. He prayed to his to the people in Ephesians that I really hope your third eye, because that's the eyes you understanding is your third eye, is woken up, that you might actually know the greatness of the Christ within us who believe. Because according to that same inner strength or spiritual authority or power was wrought by what's called the Father, in the Christ, when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, in other words, resurrected, awakened his, his spirit, far above all principalities, all power, all might, and all governmental dominions, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but in the future, which is to come. And he has put all things under his feet. And that's a, that's a metaphor to an ancient... Um, conquering where the armies would go and they'd make the king lie down and put their feet under them and they'd stand on them so what he's saying is he's given us when we have the christ teachings and the christ within us we have full authority over the over everything over the church over government over society who thinks that's a pretty cool belief and who who's who likes that idea
Gives you a lot of hope, doesn't it? Gives you a lot of hope. You start to see things very differently. Very quickly. So there's so much that was shown here, you know? And so these are some of the guys written in the Bible who were all the kind of preludes to this great time of Christ. And I love what John says here. And there are many things which Jesus did, which if they should be written, even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. In other words, there's so many teachings of Christ, the Bible is just a teeny little sneak preview. And in terms of the Christ, who is the Christ? That is the question, you know, the truth about Jesus. Who is the Christ? It says, in the beginning, I love this in the book of John, and keep in mind, this was his closest disciple, was the word, the spoken word, the word of authority. And the word was with God. And the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through all thing, him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made. And this is what the secret history of the world talks about. Everything was built around the Christ, the energy of the Christ. The Kriya Yoga talk about the Christ. In him was life. And that life was a light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. That's why it says, we, that's why I said, do not hide your light under a bushel. Shine your light. Because in him was life. And that's why as soon as you have that Christ within you and the inward Christ starts to awaken, it's like a light gets switched on. In the DNA teachings of ascension, it's like we have these fire letters that they get switched on and suddenly our DNA comes alive. But in him was life and yet life was the light of men. This is what I call a teary, a teary scripture. In other words, this is the one scripture that makes me cry a lot when I read this one. So powerful this one is. And I love what he says here. It says, he came on, he says he was in the world. And the world was made by him, but didn't even know it. He came unto his own. In other words, to his own people who supposedly were meant to believe him. And his own didn't even receive him. But to those who received him, to them he became the power to become the sons or daughters of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood. In other words, not born basically coming out of a womb. That's one form of thing nor of the will of the flesh by human like mental mental um, manipulation or power, nor someone's will, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. In other words, the spiritual power was manifested in flesh. This is some of the secrets of healing. This is how I've been able to heal myself of things and heal people. Even last night, I remember my leg was hurting and burning. And I suddenly thought, I know how to do this. And I spoke to my leg. I did some energetic acupuncture on it. A minute later, it was good. And we have all authority and all power and all Christ in the Christ. That's what he basically says. And I love this. In him was life and that life was a light of men. And we'll never get meaning in our life if we're not out there teach or not, not letting our light shine. And our light can shine in so many ways. For some, it's being the most amazing parent that brings your light to your kids. For others, it can just simply be being such a good employee. I knew of someone who just had a normal job and they knew their authority. They used to go into their workplace and every day they take authority over the spirits in their workplace and call in the energy of the Christ into their workplace. And then when they started doing that, suddenly all these affairs were exposed. The company got cleaned up. Things got, got changed. Things got sorted out. This is the kind of authority that you actually have when we start to do this. And that's why I said that life becomes the light of, our, of, of people. And there's so many things that Jesus did. And I'm going to give you a sneak preview as to what we'll be teaching on when we start teaching the, the secret teachings of Christ. Here's just some of the things he did to show you. This guy was an absolute bit of a badass, you know. He really was, you know. Um, in fact, so let's just run through these. He turned water into wine for a bruise up at a wedding feast. He made food magically appear from thin air to feed 5,000 people. Well, by the way, I've met someone who's done that. I met a lady, her name was Yvonne, years ago she did this. She actually made food magically appear for her family. 
Um, I've met a guy who magically bought money out of an ATM many times um, when he was broke. Um, I was talking to a guy the other day who connected with, with God and a spirit showed him because he was broke and in genuine trouble and showed him exactly what's crypto is to invest in for the next six months. He literally got himself out of trouble. Then the spirit said, I'm not going to tell you anymore because I've done my job. I don't help people get rich. I just make sure that anyone doing the work is provided for. Um, he he challenged his people, his family, who tried to pull him into line in public for his teachings and pretty much disowned them and said, my true family are only those who do the will of God. Bought them in the line straight away. He humiliated religious leaders in public debate. Name call him. Insulted them. He told people that the answers were inside them, not outside of them. Keep in mind at that time was a big social credit system where the Jew, where the Israelites would be excommunicated if they didn't follow the church's teaching of the day. And Jesus just lived completely outside that system. He didn't even get involved in it. So that was a badass thing to do at that day. He came invisible to the part from people trying to kill him. He basically beat the shit out of a group of bankers who were ripping people off. He didn't pay taxes, and when he voluntarily decided to do it, he miraculously manifested the money. He could heal sickness, disease, or emotional issues, stopping people from living their purpose. And he used to do unusual ways to test people's humilities. Like he would get them to do weird things to try and, 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 and get them to do that. Hang out with prostitutes, strippers. Deliberately healed people on the Sabbath day in violation of the laws. Fast for 40 days without food or water. A dry fast. Did supernatural miracles. Shunned kingship when they tried to make him the king. Told the Roman governor in his crucifixion he had no power over him other than what God had given him. Which takes some pretty decent balls. Lost the, lost the absolute royal plot at his disciples when they kept being silly and, and, and going into little faith and being afraid. They often get afraid, and oh, how do we cast out a demon? He goes, oh, you absolute morons. Like, do you not actually listen to what I'm saying? Like, you got a phone, just kick the buggers out. Stop being scared of these things. Um, even told Peter, one of his best friends, that he was being influenced by Satan when Peter got emotional and tried to get him off his path. He just knew he was provided for, and he goes, he basically said, if you're worried about money and being provided for, you actually don't have much faith. That's pretty much what he says in Matthew 6. He said, if you've got faith, you'll know you're provided for. I was fortunate to grow up in a church that taught me this stuff from young, because naturally I'm a bit of a worrier about that stuff. And I know I always go back to that. And I think, okay, well, so you're getting a little faith, mate. <laughs> Just remember what the scriptures teach you. And it's very quick and very easy. So who was he real? He was not a wimpy douchebag guy. He was a badass. He hung out with a normal, he's getting crucified on the cross with nails in his blooming hand, bleeding away in absolute agony, as you can imagine, and he's praying for the people who are doing it to him. One of my favourite stories, when I remember accounts of him, or whether it's true or whether it was just a metaphor, but when he had the two other feasts on the cross with him, and one of the thieves said to, said to him, remember me when you come into your kingdom, because he, he really repented of what he'd done and, and he just said this day you'll be with me in paradise and that's the beauty of repentance and repentance doesn't mean you go back to the church and be a good boy or girl repentance means looking deeply at your life and one thing i'm going to i'm going to warn you if you do the secret teachings of the christ your life is going to be turned around a bit you're going to be really reflecting on actions and how you've been living your life i found the more i got back into it it's pretty confronting and pretty and pretty challenging it's been confronting for me because I've realized I've had to repent of some things. And repent doesn't mean anything religious. Just repent means to turn 180 degrees, to realize certain things you were doing were not aligned with who you really are. And so if you learn the teachings of Christ, your life is going to be turned around a bit. You're going to be mucked around a bit. Just type a Y if you're ready to be mucked around a bit to get your life to the next level and, you, and, you, and you're ready for it. If you're not, you definitely don't want to be subscribing to this teachings. This is going to be one of the few webinars that rather than try and sell people into it, I'll try and talk people out of this because you've really got to be ready for this. Um, many of his miracles were done to improve the quality of people's lives, not convert them to a weird religion. Fiona, I love that. That is one of my favorite comments today. Always started a path, not turning back. In fact, Jesus actually said to one of his disciples, 
He said, anyone who starts the path and then turns back is not fit for the kingdom of heaven. That's what he actually says. If you start the path and then turn back, you're not fit for the kingdom of heaven. So he's pretty pretty brutal um, with, with basically his disciples. He was a results man. He was actions. He was a sorcerer. He lived insanely abundantly. Here, yeah, Christian already mucked around one and more. Yeah, I messed up totally. He probably worked it out by now. So, um, absolutely. So, yeah, you want to keep propelling forward. Donald Trump's on steroids can't even come close to Jesus. And mind you, he's a pretty good badass. I mean, that 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 picture, I have to say, I thought, man, well, I mean, I don't believe it was staged, but even if it was, I thought, fuck that. I want to make that my mental campaign picture to lift my game. And because, yeah, I'm like, I don't like what's going on in my society. And no, and I like what he said. I'm not going to sit here and let the deep state take control of our country. He said, we've got to fight, you know, and it's, he likes Liam Neeson and taking a look ordinary. So Christ isn't this namby pamby, weird looking kind of, um, you know, effeminate guy wearing a beard who's just joined some kind of new age movement. He is a real damn badass. He makes Neo from the Matrix look beatable. So believing in something, even if it means sacrificing everything, that's been my other thing I've realized. I thought, you know, was you got a bit soft. Now on a day, I'm just going to own some of my stuff. I thought you got a bit soft lately, bro. You know, you've you lost a bit of your balls. You've been trying to do this kind of stuff, but not paying the price. And I look, I, I look at Trump a lot because I go, well, whether people agree with him or not, and everyone I know even doesn't like him agrees. He believes in his truth and he's paying a price for it. And he's not afraid to pay the price. He's not afraid to fight to do what he believes in. And I just thought, well, I'm going to need your strength, Christ, within me, which is beyond the normally fearful kind of quite silly Warren Black, which I've got that kind of still that fearful boy, you know, from that um, childhood. It's always there waiting to come back if I move away. But I thought when I stand in my in my in the inward Christ, I have authority over anything and everything, and I have the strength to go through. I mean, you know, when I used to go into the courtrooms, and I haven't shared a lot of this on webinars before, but some of you would have known my stories when I back in the last 20 years, when I actually end up on the internet for going into the court single-handedly beating the Queensland police in this thing, winning so many cases, I had the police personally visit me and tell me they were shutting me down. And that, and honestly, every time I'd go into court, I'd be shitting myself. I would be on my knees praying. I'd say, God, Christ within me, you help me, guide me, lead me, lead me against this great evil. I would be taking authority over the spirits in the courtroom and binding them up. Because I, because the script, because, because Jesus said, you have authority to bind these spirits and put them out of commission. And I would do that. I'd bind these spirits. I can remember even years ago, a friend of mine, she was getting horrendously treated in her job. And I said to her, now, I know that that's a spirit of false accusation. It's a certain spirit. I won't name it here. But I said, we're going to take authority over these spirits, bind them up, and we're going to replace the spirit guides with your boss. As soon as we did that, the boss called me and apologized the next day and gave her a promotion. So <laughs> this stuff really does work, I can tell you. And for those of you who are in the tax investment regulatory, you're about to get a bit of a treat because we're going to be teaching in the next few weeks about the spirit guides and getting more into that. We're going to start tapping into that. So believing in this stuff. So we're not advocating a religion institution because Jesus never did that. No great prophet ever did that. Buddha did not go, hey, I'm starting the church, guys. Let's get going, dudes, dudesses. Um, Krishna didn't. All these people actually, if anything, stood against the religion of the day and got the people back to their basic faith. John Wesley was like that. He went against the establishment. Charles Finney did the same. And in fact, he specifically told people not to seek answers outside themselves because he said life's answers is within inside of them and in their inner spirit being that the kingdom of heaven is within you. So Jesus, in fact, never really got involved in churches. He, what he encouraged was the gathering together of the saints or, or the ecclesia. The word ecclesia means called out ones, called together, those who called out from the system. The church is like a synagogue, an organized religion. That is why I personally like the word ecclesia, because it means the called out ones. Um, and that's what we are. If you're here and you're not part of a religious institution, you're one of the called out ones. And he was very nasty to religious leaders and used to even humiliate the leaders 
um, who were basically full of ego and pride with no real spiritual power. And just to look at some of the exciting stories that Jesus did, you know, um, and there's quite a few, but this is just a sneak preview and we're going more into this. Like I said, he beat the shit out of these bankers and money changers. Um, he basically took a can of nine tails of whip and he went absolutely feral. What they were actually doing, they were ripping people off with, they were like money sharks, loan sharks. They're, and they were actually doing it in the temple to rip people off. And they did it by creating a fictitious money system instead of using true money to force people to rely on their system. Not that any of us would ever have experienced anything as naughty as that, but that's basically what they were doing. Um, and people were in huge financial hardship because of his bankers, his taxes, and all that. And Jesus was like, you motherfuckers, fuck you. Took a stand for it. And Jesus turned up to the bank with a cat of nine tails and said, fuck you little pieces of shit. How dare you rip these people off and take advantage of the less fortunate. And God, we need some people like that. I mean, one of my favorite um, music albums is a guy called Steve Camp. And he has this song he wrote in the 80s. He was a prophet who did a lot of music to wake people up. And one of his songs was called Where Are the Heroes Gone? When we need them so desperately. You know, who will step up from the crowd and be strong enough to lead? Um, and he basically, he, he quotes from the book of Hebrews where it talks about the great, the great heroes of the, of, of the faith, the ones who just stood up, stepped up and spoke out. I remember standing in, um, in, in Memphis Theatre where Martin Luther King was shot and it was surreal. I specifically went there only for that reason. I wanted to stand in that theatre and feel the spirit of Martin Luther King and what he stood for. And it was a profound moment. And Jesus was very much like that. And he, and he taught his disciples. Those who learned his teachings became badasses. That is why it's interesting that to this day, you know, my cousins, um, all of them are like badasses, you know, because they grew up in strong, strong churches that taught this stuff, all of us did. I can, like one of my cousins, she's literally, my, my aunt broke open Cambodia after Pol Pot, was one of the first ones to get in, um, bring in a whole lot of missionary work. Um, basically, her son has carried a legacy, Pastor Gary Hewitt, doing, doing extraordinary work with Cambodia, awareness, getting kids out, you know, to schools, as well as teaching them the, the teachings of Christ, giving them practical help, getting them out. My other cousin, Kelly, you know, God to a wonder, the genocide so severe, people so brutally raped and been involved in creating healing groups and even having rapists sing with their victims where they're forgiving each other. You know, this is the kind of badasses that they are. So badass doesn't mean you get up and teach or something or get up and do a Trump. She's a badass. I mean, my cousin Kelly is an absolute badass. I mean, she goes in and you'll never hear about it because she doesn't speak about it except to tell people how, what we're on the need, but she gets in there and she teaches people this stuff. She gets in people's faces and says, get in, you know, you guys in the West don't ever think you're not doing well when you go to these places. Um, one of my other cousins, Neil, you know, the amount of help he's given, which people will never know about how much of his money is a doctor and the work he's done to help the Cambodians. So much so, but they've been involved with the West Coast Eagles, you know. So and badass can simply mean that what you do, you do radically. You know, if you're making a difference to help the less fortunate, you're doing it radically. If you're a health practitioner, you're doing it radically. They're like, I am going to help people get healed. I am not going to tolerate, you know, seeing people be fucked up with wellness by pharmaceuticals. And I've seen some badass health practitioners. And I'm I'm here because I'm going to help people get well. I'm going to help the people get well who are the freedom fighters, you know, people who are making a difference. Because I know that if they're sick, it limits their effectiveness. There's so many ways you can be a badass in what you're doing and be like Christ. Um but yeah, I love how Jesus embarrassed the religious leaders of his days. He, and like I said, imagine a big social credit system. If you got kicked out of church, you were in really deep shit. And Jesus was like, oh, God, fuck all of you. You know, he deliberately broke their rules. He ignored the rules of the day. He didn't just kind of question them. He deliberately broke the rules, deliberately. He, this inspired me so much in COVID, just so you know, if it wasn't for Christ and his teachings, I could never have got through that. I would deliberately go into places about my mask to give people courage. Knew I was going to get a, a hammered. And it would be terrifying every time I did it. I got hammered every time I'd be shaking. And every time I'd say, Christ, give me strength. I said to my, I said to my sons at the time, I said, you know, think of Martin Luther King. I hardly doubt people back there were encouraging him, you know. But there's no way that that man went there speaking for black, you know, for, 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 for coloured people's rights 
People weren't encouraging him. He was getting insulted. People were not listening to him. But he would have gone out, but he would have gone out with his conviction saying, no, I will not sit here and see this go on. I will not see people have their houses burned out for their colour. Fuck this. I have a dream that this will all change. That was the kind of one Jesus had. In fact, in the book of Daniel, it talks about when they passed a law saying that no one could pray anymore except to Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king. The first thing Daniel did the next day was he went right out into the public square, got on his knees and started praying directly to God. Got thrown in a lion's den and got miraculously delivered. William Penn, in the William Penn case I mentioned, as soon as they passed laws in the Star Chamber banning any, Christ any preaching of any religion other than authorised by the state, the first thing he did was um, he went out and deliberately broke the law. And that was what got the William Penn case where people were being jailed but brought in the trial by jury. I had the fortune, the good fortune to meet Brother Yun through Danny the Liar, the guy I mentioned, because I did Danny a great service. I helped him with something. And this man is probably one of the most famous men in the world at one stage. He, he led the whole persecuted church in China, this guy. An absolute badass among badasses. He... When China, in China, as you would know, with the credit system there, if you go, you, you're allowed to run a religion, but under the system. He deliberately has broken it. He got tortured many, many times for his faith. Is the only man in history in, in that China who's ever escaped the maximum security prison. And when you read his book, he literally was taken out by angels. His story is like the heavenly man is one of the stories. And of course, I remember as a kid, I kind of revered this guy. And I'm and next minute in 2012, I'm sitting in a restaurant in Northbridge with this man sobbing my eyes out like a baby. One of three people who got the privilege to meet him. And this, this was a guy who literally left, left there. He left um, China by a miracle. He walked out of there with a passport that wasn't even his and just spoke with authority and just had this miraculous um, left China when he was the most wanted man in the whole place. And... But when he, ran the, when he ran the church in China underground, where he was tortured, lost the use of his legs at one stage, he literally was like doing extraordinary healings. And I got to meet with him, got a message. He, he prayed over me and I think I sobbed for days after it because he gave me a message of my future and where I was heading. And a lot of it I'm still doing today. But a man who taught Christ, who went, when he came to Australia, he got straight into some of the big churches' faces and he said to them, you guys think you're running a good church, but you've lost your way. You've lost your light because you're so caught up with the materials of your culture. He said, you don't know Christ at all, but you think that you actually do. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, Beth read his book. Yeah, it's an incredible story, isn't it, Beth? Amazing guy. And I got the privilege to meet this guy. Very, very blessed. Um, but this was Jesus. He went deliberately. He broke the rules. And the reason I'm sharing all this is because, like, you'll be learning this, but this is the kind of strength you're going to have to have if society keeps going the way you're going, we're not only we are saying, oh, you go, fuck these stupid laws. That's why I love my friend Danny the Liar in Melbourne. Danny just said to me, brother, he said, the church goes on as normal. We're still going. People, whether they're vaccinated or unvaccinated, are welcome to the church. He said, after what I've been through Sri Lanka, he said, being in an Andrews prison would be nothing. He said he's welcome to it. But he said, I will not bow my church. He said, any way, shape or form against, against law, against evil laws. And that's the kind of strength but Christ taught. So he was a badass. He deliberately ate foods against the Sabbath day, deliberately healed people in front of the religious leaders. They feared him. He used to kick their little asses in debates. He would smash them in debates. He'd embarrass them because he also knew the law really well. He wasn't just some simple guy. He learnt the law. He studied it. He went to India from 12 to 30 in, in England and he learnt from some of the great mystery schools and the Essenes and the Gnostics. And the thing is, without a spiritual purpose and a connection and the Christ kind of leadership, you'll never experience true prosperity. Even if you get rich, as Jesus said, the love of money can be the root of all evil. And he said a rich man or woman, he said, who's attached to their wealth is never going to fully enter the kingdom of heaven. In other words, you enjoy your wealth, you do it, but always know you can't take it with you. I love a story I heard about J.D. Rockefeller from a friend of mine. True story. At age 53, he's a billionaire who'd been a ruthless, corrupt man. This is part of you, you probably never heard of J.D. Rockefeller. Rockefeller actually um, got very sick, like insanely sick. And he didn't have long to live. And he's sitting there miserable. He couldn't eat hardly at all. His weight was literally hardly anything. He was in constant chronic pain. And as he had weeks to live, he thought, what's the point of it all? I spent my whole life making all this money for what? 
And so what he did was he got inspired. He called his lawyers, attorney, accountants, and just simply said, I'm giving all my money, apart from what I basically need, to basically into foundations. He said, I'm going to help. They're going to make a difference. He became like a Scrooge. He said, uh, like, he had a big turnaround. He said, I'm going to actually give my money to help hospitals. He put a lot of money into Penicil at the time, which saved a lot of lives into many medical research. Everything he could put into helping humanity, he went nuts and started pouring money in. Because he said, when I die, I want to at least know that I've left something that's going to help people. What ended up happening was he got so much meaning in his life from doing it, he suddenly got better and lived till 98, another 45 years. So <laughs> that shows you that when you start to get meaning and purpose in your life, you won't have mental health issues. You won't. You, a lot of you stress because you'll have a meaning. You'll have something in your life, something that burns you. As Wesley said, something that burns your spirit, burns your soul, that makes you alive. And that, and 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 then, then when you start to create wealth, you can use your wealth to really do greater good. And like I said, that's why I've I've made a, I've been really reflecting, and I'm still very much on this journey as much as you, everyone. And the more I walk this path, the more I'm on my knees, and the more I just say, Christ, I have much to learn from you still, much to much to reveal, much to bring forward. So really, this was just, like I said, I just wanted to get out there today and teach something just to get out there and just share some of the introduction of the teachings of Christ. So before I share about what will happen after here, anyone got any questions, feedback? I mean, how, how did it go for you today? Love to get your honest feedback. Whether you enjoyed it, whether, you, whether, it, helped, whether it gave you anything of value. Tony enjoyed it. Great. Interesting. Yeah. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, to the teachings of, of Christ. There's a lot. And like I said, I've really given you the tiniest skerrick in 90 minutes. And I want to just give little bits of sneak preview, but this Christine is so much to learn. Oh, there is, there is. Especially you start to learn the authority of the spirit realm and how to overcome it. Really enjoyed it. Need to replay it. Fiona gave a good reminder of the bigger vision. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, look, really from here. Amen. Great session, Christine. Excellent. I'm glad you enjoyed it, Christine. So just, I want to be giving sometime in August, I've decided. I want to get out there and do it. Um, I just wanted to give a bit of a sneak preview Okay, great small questions. The problem is once you start this, there's going to be so much, you know, it's very hard, you know, um, once you get started to kind of, it's like the more you know, the more you learn, the more you realise you don't know. So I'm planning to do at least four, possibly more. Um, so I'm planning to start it in the first week of August. Um, if you're interested in being informed on this, um, who would be interested in being kept informed and being part of this to get involved and find out more about it? Because what I'll probably do is, is share more about it. And Tony, yep. 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 So here's a link, okay? So this way you can just basically um, at least be kept informed about what's coming up because what I'm going to do is give a bit of an outline as to how it's going to work and what we're going to do with it and how we're going to you know how it's going to run basically so here's the link well look thank you everyone I really do appreciate you coming along today and like I said always interested in feedback and um Look forward to seeing all of you, um, some of you, when we start the teachings. Um, we'll be starting off quite simple. Today was a bit of an overview overall. My plan is to be very much doing some of the Jesus the Badass and really giving the basics of Christ and then breaking it down and going deeper as we go through it. So especially I want to be sharing about the spiritual authority that Christ teaches. It's going to be one of the master classes alone because knowing your spiritual authority is going to change your life i can tell you that now so thank you everyone and i'll see you soon